here together today for a community and this is a series that'll go through November 2021. And I'm going to share that link with you today. I wanted to make sure we had all the settings correct on the Zoom before I just went for the whole series. So I'll share the registration for that with you before we leave today. And hopefully you'll join us for this entire series uh, when you're able to. I already told you who's in the room, uh, myself, Jen Tenney, and Courtney Lanham, and we're all employees of the CED. And we'll get to know you a little better as this series goes on. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit about the CED in general. We are part of WVU and the Health Sciences Center, uh, which gives us a really nice position to partner with various clinics and disciplines across WVU and throughout the state and look at research uh, and all the great stuff that comes along with us. So great partnerships can be built uh, just by being a part of that health science. We're really proud of that. We're also part of a larger national network. And some of you may have been to CED trainings in the, in the past, so these slides will probably look really familiar to you. Uh, but there is a CED in every state. And, and so you'll see that no matter where you are, uh, you can get some sort of services or supports through the national program. These are the main priorities of a Center for Excellence in Disabilities and that they are education and training, technical assistance, direct services, dissemination of information and research activities throughout the state. Here's a quick look at the CED in West Virginia. Uh, as you can see, we may not have staff in each county, but we do serve all 55 counties. So you may see our staff uh, co-located in DHHR offices or other pockets around the state, um, social service type offices where we're sharing that space and serving those clients across multiple counties. We have about 90 staff across seven programs in four clinics, and that does change. Uh, programs come and go, clinics and initiatives come and go as well. So you'll see that number change as you participate in CED activities. And we're funded and partner with multiple state and federal partners. Many of you I, I see here represented on the call today. You can become an affiliate um, of CED, and here's the information to do so. And please reach out if you'd like to look into that further, but it just keeps you connected in CED happenings, opportunities that are coming up, initiatives that you can be a part of. So if you're not a CED affiliate, I would encourage you to join that club. Okay, so really quickly, uh, what I would like to do is just hear from everybody in the room, and this is a practice effort in using our polls as well, because we're gonna use these as we get together and have different discussions. So I believe I've launched a poll, and these all are anonymous. I'll let you know if I was ever collecting, um, you know, who was responding, but all of our polls today are anonymous. So let us know where you're joining us from today. And if you're not from one of these regions, and I didn't know all of these different regions that they were called this, so I thought this map was interesting. And if you're from outside the state or bordering state or you're a guest here with us, um, you could pop in the chat what your other or out of state um, response looks like. This is my first time using a poll, so thanks guys. Thanks for playing along. So it looks like we've got the majority of our group so far is up here uh, in Mountaineer country. We've got some, we've got some representation from the Northern Panhandle, a little bit from Potomac Highlands. Uh, Eastern Panhandle, that tiny little spot over there. Nice to see you represented. No one from Mountain Lakes. So now we know we need to find someone from that part of the state to bring to our discussion. So I think this will be really helpful and we'll probably revisit this map each month. Uh, and then we've got everybody else. We are represented. Very good. And uh, Rodney's coming in from Western Pennsylvania. So close enough. We'll, we'll keep you, Rodney. We can, and we've got Columbia, Maryland, our guest speaker, who I'll introduce here shortly. So pretty, pretty close by. Good neighbors. Mm. Thank you. Mm. All right. And I believe this will show you those results. Yes, can you see those? Mm. So just to give you an idea. So we got strongest in Mountaineer countries winning and second place, New River, Greenbrier Valley. So this will be great to expand on these regions as we get back together each month. Thank you for doing that. All right, so what is a community of practice? Maybe you've participated in one, maybe it's been related to clinical health, um, 
early child development, whatever the case may be, I just wanted to cover really quickly what they are if you may not be familiar. So according to the C CDC, a community of practice is defined as a group of people who share a concern, a set of problems, or a passion about a topic, and who deepen their knowledge and expertise by interacting on an ongoing basis. So that's why we're doing a series where we come back each month and we explore various topics. Mm. And the various elements of a COP are that the community enables interaction through discussion, collaborate activities, and relationship building. That we have a shared domain of interest and a shared practice of experiences, stories, tools, and ways of addressing recurring problems. And so that for us is employment for individuals with disabilities across the state of West Virginia. And what we're looking at, if you reviewed the registration link, we're looking at higher education, vocational training, preparing employers and preparing employees over the span of the series. Of course, we're starting with higher education and I was really excited to see so many K-12 email addresses um, on the registration links because these are the partnerships and you know, you're the agencies that I'm talking about, schools are included in that. Uh, so really grateful to, to see that represented. And this will be the structure for our meetings. Um, this is our structure for this meeting and it'll remain for our other ones in the series. Um, so I'll do a quick introduction every time just to orient everybody, then we'll have a guest presentation. And then we'll do breakout sessions that will be moderated by myself, Jen and Courtney with your help. And then we'll do a wrap up and report. And we're kind of in like 30 minute chunks, but I know those are gonna go over like today, I'm spending a little more time on the introduction because it's our first meeting, uh, but that'll be the general um, structure of the meeting. So we'll always know what, what to expect when we come back together. And like I said, I'm going to send you all out the link for the rest of the meetings. I have created that unless I find any big, huge bugs with the way I have this set up today. Uh, I'll share that with you before we leave. So you see our first three months are higher education. Then we talk about vocational education for three months and then preparing employers and employees. I do have uh, many of our guest speakers lined up. And so hopefully some of these are piquing your interest. Um, we do want to have someone from a different part of the country come or, you know, just outside of West Virginia, come and tell us what they're doing, what they've seen, what are the trends. Uh, we love federal data sources that can tell us what the, the state of things are across the country. And we can kind of compare that to what we're doing here in West Virginia and come up with some, some strategies to make improvements where they're needed. So just a quick idea of what, what we're gonna see <clears throat> moving forward. So just real quick, um, I'm gonna stop share and I believe we have another quick poll and it's as we're getting into talking about higher education. What I'd like to hear from everybody is um, part of this, since we were funded, I should have said, we were funded by the uh, West Virginia Developmental Disabilities Council for this activity, which I believe was in the registration information, uh, but that's what we're doing. And so we've got outcomes to report, just like everybody else has outcomes uh, for their agencies and funding agencies. So what we'd like to do is do a quick pre-survey, and this is just going to get your ideas of what you already know about higher education and the link with employers and if that conversation is happening. Uh, so this is our pre-survey. We're going to answer the same questions um, to see if we've expanded on what's available or our knowledge of what's available across West Virginia. So this is just three quick statements. Again, anonymous. And um, they're just strongly disagree to strongly agree about what you know of the current communication between higher education employers and who uh, is seeking higher education opportunities. So you should have another poll pop up. And so we're looking at, are there resources out to help people with disabilities? What do you think or do you not know? Um, are employers partnering with colleges to find qualified candidates coming out of college program, programs? You might not know, that's fine. And finally, um, I think college students with disabilities are exiting college programs with all the tools they need to go to work. So just get your thoughts on the current state of higher education and employment in West Virginia. I'm pleased to see some, some somewhat agrees. That's a good positive. We've still got some rolling in here. So I'll give it another 30 seconds or so to get your responses. Okay. 
Okay, I'm gonna stop the poll and share the results. And so this is where we think we currently stand or just of our knowledge. And so there might be more out there, there might be less out there uh, that's changed over the years. So as far as a variety of resources to help enter and complete education, a large majority agree that that's out there and that's fantastic. I even see some strongly agree even better. Uh, we don't know and that's great. Maybe by April, you're gonna know more of what those are. And so we've got a little bit of somewhat disagree and no strongly disagree. So that's, that's a really positive response there. Um, as far as employers partnering with colleges, um, again, we've got a strong group here that agrees that that's happening and that's great. And maybe we can share with each other in our smaller groups where that's happening uh, and what that looks like so we can um, share that resource. So, and again, some down here in the disagree. Uh, so there's always work to be done. And I think college students with disabilities are exiting college programs with all the tools they need to go to work. So we're kind of all around the middle here. We're not sure a little bit and, and maybe we don't know what we need. Um, so identifying what those gaps are might be part of our conversation as well. Thank you very much for participating in that survey as well. Um, all right. Really quickly, what I would like to do is um, introduce our guest speaker. And I just want to tell you a little bit and share some resources um, just from what I've read about the organization prior to us coming together here. All right. So, uh, and you saw in the chat that we have our visitor this month is um, coming out of Columbia, Maryland. And her name is Dr. Meg Griggle. And she's the co-director at Think College and senior research fellow at the Institute for Community Inclusion. Um, I think you can tell from these bullets that She's a fantastic, this is the right conversation to be having for our kickoff conversation. She's got some fantastic experience. Um, so Think College, and I'm sure she'll tell us a little more about it, is a national organization focused on research, policy, and practice. So we wanna know what is the data showing? What's working? Um, you know, Are there good outcomes, people getting jobs, completing programs? Uh, and so I think she's got a lot of knowledge from these different experiences that she shared with us here. Uh, wide range of research grants and all focused on the inclusion and advancement of individuals with disabilities, which is what we're wanting to come together and talk about. Um, a lot of experience in um, peer review, writing book chapters, co-authoring books, and again, focused on college access and increasing uh, that higher education completion. Um, Dr. Griggle has worked with families as a special education teacher and then has moved into that technical assistance and consultation field. So any of you that have come up in the field, you know that that gives you such a wealth of knowledge uh, when you're coming from a policy perspective. And I actually watched um, an interview with Dr. Griggle from 2018 that um, I'll, I'll share in the chat if, if she's all right with that. Uh, but I found it really, I was really enticed by it and just um, her passion for supporting inclusive environments and uh, bringing up uh, the population that we all work with and we want to bring up as well. So I think that we're gonna get some really valuable information um, from Meg. And without further ado, I think I kept that in 18 minutes and I'm gonna pass it to you, Dr. Griggle. Thank you so much for joining us. Okie doke. Well, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to get to share some information about um, our work at Think College and um, get to hear some of your thoughts about how it might apply to your work. I love the idea of this community of practice um, that the DD Council funded. Um, we also, I work for USED um, uh, at UMass Boston. I know I said I'm from Columbia, Maryland, but I have worked for UMass Boston for 10 years. Wait a minute, 11 years now. I'm like what year is it? 2020 was a blur, so I'm not sure if we can count that. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna, let me share screen. Um, it's always weird when someone puts a picture of you up with like your stats, it always feels <laughs> a little awkward. Um, I'm gonna try and keep within the 25 minute range, um, but I am gonna be on after to answer questions. So feel free to put them in the chat, but I'm probably gonna try and move through the content and then we can unpack questions. And then if you have a question afterwards that maybe you think might take longer, just shoot me an email because um, I'm certainly available um, beyond this time. So let me see if I can do this right. 
share. Can you see my screen? Yes, okay. Um, and I apologize for looking away from you. I have a dual monitor system, so it's over here. I wonder if I can drag it over, if that's gonna muck up your view. So I hate to look away from people, but hopefully you're not looking at me anyway. Um, okay. Well, that, that took away the presentation. Oh, it did? It did. It's just oh, a see, that's, now. That's there weird. we go, you're back. Okay, see, I knew that was a bad idea. The whole screen sharing thing, I'm, you'd think I'd be good at it working remotely, but not so much. All right, so inclusive higher education as a pathway to competitive employment for students with intellectual disability. And um, Mandy, I did notice that you're talking about disability with a big D, and I think that's great. Um, the work that we do at Think College is particularly focused on students with intellectual disability and developmental disability not necessarily students with ADHD or learning disabilities or mental health supports or orthopedic disability, the, 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 the big D. Um, and, but I think what we've learned over the past 20 years is that many of the things that we're learning about access, accessibility, expectations, and outcomes um, for students with intellectual disability actually are, are also issues for students with any disability. There's a lot of commonality about the needs in higher education and connecting those outcomes to good employment outcomes. So with that, I will get moving. Um, so just, I didn't know the extent to which anybody in this group may or may not have heard of what inclusive higher education is. It's a term that we've used for the past 15 years. Um, to describe this emerging field in higher education. It's an alternative pathway to and through higher ed for students with intellectual disability, culminating in paid employment or pursuit of further higher education. Um, so it is a lot creating pathways into higher ed um, that weren't previously there. And you may or may not know that inclusive higher education experiences and options have really changed in the past 15 to 20 years. Um, I started this work back in 1998. You can see that's not even on the chart because we didn't have any data back then. Um, but in 2004, uh, you know, a survey my colleague Deborah did uh, identified 25 programs. And when we did a national study um, five years later, there were 150 programs. Now we're at about 300. This number goes up and down almost weekly with programs either opening or programs closing. So we do have a directory which is linked here. And I did send my the PDF of my slides to Mandy. So I'm happy for you to share any and all of these with anybody who wants them. Um, but we do have a directory of all the programs in the country. Can I ask um, a question? Sure. Um, I was just wondering if that also includes this couple of schools that are specifically for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, or if it's just programs within regular colleges. So if it, the, the criteria is it has to be at an accredited college. So if it is not an accredited college, it would not be included in our directory. So. Okay, I just was curious because I know there's one in Florida and I think one of the Carolinas has one that is accredited that's specifically for people with disabilities that I just recently found out about. So I was just curious if that was part of your data sheet as well. Yeah, it's really self-report. So this isn't part of a study. This is a honestly, okay. purpose we offer to programs who serve students with intellectual disability to facilitate information sharing with the public, with families, with students. Um, and allows us to manage an idea of what program grows throughout the country. Thank you, sorry for interrupting. <laughs> no, no, that's okay, I get it. It's, it's. Um, I have the feeling you, there's gonna be other questions and I it, we'll get, I promise we'll get to them. Um, this directory actually allowed us to, to estimate for the first time, frankly, um, the number of students with intellectual disability who are enrolled in higher education. This number comes from data we collected in 2019. So um, just over 6,000 students with intellectual disability are enrolled in higher ed. I think it's more. 35 programs didn't offer us the number of students. So the average number is 10 to 12. So you're looking at another 350, probably 400. 
Um, so it's really important that we recognize these students are already in higher education. How they got there and where they're going is sort of what your group is going to <laughs> grapple with. Um, so here's a map of where the current programs that are in the public think college directory are. Um, and you can see West Virginia, I understand, has an emerging program. It's not in our directory. I would love for someone to let me know who should fill that in and get that information in our directory. It would be great to share that with folks. What I will say is I caution you to think this number is going to stay static. It will not. And my colleague Kate Weir, who updates this map every other month for us, is, is constantly grappling with um, the ups and downs of the number of programs in the country. One thing to also say about these numbers is they are not all programs that serve adult students in some cases. For example, in Massachusetts and in Maryland, many of these programs are dual enrollment programs or they could be called concurrent enrollment or college-based transition programs. So they are high school programs operated at a college where students do enroll in college classes, but they would not be considered adult college programs. So you're seeing a mix of those numbers in these data. So just to give you a sense of who's out there, um, Almost 60% of the programs are at four-year colleges and universities, about 40% are at two-year, much smaller numbers of technical and trade schools. Florida is actually um, one of the leading states where we are seeing technical and trade schools beginning to become involved. I think that is a, an issue we need to grapple with in the future. I think there's a lot of potential in programs for students with ID in those types of um, higher ed institutions, but we have not seen them at the table a lot as yet. Um, so what does a program look like? Um, especially if people haven't been involved in inclusive higher ed, it's sometimes really hard for people to think, all right, how does this set up? How do, how do students succeed in these programs? Um, there are typically alternate admissions processes and requirements. Um, those requirements may range. They may look at level of independence. They may look at support needs. Um, sometimes there's an academic component to it, um, but not always. Um, frankly, I think the arbiter of what makes somebody successful in higher education is more than anything else is their interest in being there. If they want to be there, they're going to succeed. And if their parents are the ones who want them to be there, they are likely not going to succeed. <laughs> that, is, that is the dichotomy. Um, they accept students who are non-degree seeking. For the most part, these programs are non-degree seeking. They're for a, a, a different kind of credential or certificate. They vary in length, can be two years, three years, four years, sometimes one year, pretty rare. Two year is the most common. Even at four year institutions, two year programs are the most common. They vary strongly in the level of inclusion. So how much access students have to coursework um, and to employment. Um, most of them have an established course of study that leads to a certificate, and some may offer federal student aid. Um, I'll get into that a tiny little bit, but I didn't want to get sidetracked with um, the whole CTP thing. So what caused this great influx in growth of higher education access for people with intellectual disability was the passage um, of the Higher Education Opportunities Act which is a reauthorization of the Higher Ed Act in 2008. This has been up for reauthorization multiple times since then, and it has not yet to be reauthorized. Um, but it had really important implications for students with intellectual disability. Um, first, it created an access point for federal student aid for students with ID. So prior to this, students with intellectual disability who didn't have a high school diploma and who couldn't pass an ability to benefit test and who were not degree seeking could not access federal student aid. Um, this law changed those restrictions, um, allowed the Secretary of Education to waive those restrictions. And now higher ed programs that are approved as something called a comprehensive transition program or a CTP are allowed to offer eligible students with ID access to three forms of federal student aid. The big takeaway for all of you is students who can't afford to go to college, if they go to a CTP, can get federal student aid 
and that opens access, it opens equity. So it's a really important and it's a game changer for higher ed because now these programs aren't some special little something that aren't legitimate. These are federal financial aid programs. So it, it lends a huge element of legitimacy to, to these higher education pathways. Um, another big change that happened because of the HEOA was the, the dedication of funds through Congress and appropriations to a model demonstration project called the Transition Post-Secondary Program for Students with Intellectual Disability. Oh my goodness, you think your place has bad acronyms. TIPSIDS are the acronym for these model demos. Um, it's a mouthful, but they have been funded and I'm gonna tell you more about the TIPSIDS. Um, and then it also created authorization for funds for a national coordinating center to provide technical assistance, to do evaluation, to begin to develop accreditation standards for these types of programs. Um, Think College at the Institute for Community Inclusion at the University of Massachusetts, Boston has been the national coordinating center since 2010. We have had to recompete for that center uh, twice, so again in 2015 and uh, recently when all of our jobs were on the hook in September. So we're all really happy to still be doing this great work. Um, so that's the, this law changed the game for people with intellectual disabilities. The outcomes were centralized source of information and support, that's us, program development enhancement at 120 institutions of higher education, that's the TIPSID program, data on 4,000 plus students um, of their, the courses they've taken, the employment situations they've been in, their campus membership, a huge amount of data. Um, it also legitimized flexible access into higher ed and financial aid as, as opposed to, unless you're degree seeking, unless you have a high school diploma, you can't go to college or you can't get financial aid. It really did change and provided um, flexibility that did not exist prior to this. It set a standard for inclusion it really talked and is very clear that um, for programs to receive these funds or to offer federal student aid, students should not be segregated, isolated, um, solely served in specialized settings or with other people only with intellectual disability. And then finally, it emphasized employment as the goal of higher education, which is a huge, huge um, issue, not only with the TIPSIDs, but with higher ed for people with ID in general. If, it's not just a fun place to go for three, four, or five years. You really need to go there and come out of it with a job. So um, a huge part of our work is get, helping people get there. Um, for anybody, I have the feeling everybody on this call is familiar with the term intellectual disability. Sometimes people aren't, and I'm respectful of the way people come into this. Um, this is the federal definition of intellectual disability in the Higher Education Opportunities Act, which is really interesting because it's not the same definition as in IDEA or in WIOA, <laughs> which can sometimes lead to conversations, let's put it that way. Um, but this is who we're talking about. So um, the National Coordinating Center, as I said, has been around for 10 years. We put together all of the information we've learned on our website um, which is www.thinkcollege.net. I'm pretty sure I have that at the end of the presentation. So we are charged with knowledge development and evaluation, technical assistance and dissemination, and leadership and coordination. Um, and we take it. We take each of these jobs very seriously. We do work with the TIPSIDs. We also work with um, school systems. We work with non-TIPSID funded. IHEs, we worked to help develop policy. We um, create, I think, eight or nine different types of publications. We run affinity groups. We work with practitioners. We operate a national help desk. Um, pretty much anything anybody needs, are, we, we decide it's in our scope. So we, we work really hard to try and arm people with information and um, vision to uh, move this inclusive agenda forward. All right, so deep breath. The TIPSIDs, um, their goal is to create, expand, or enhance high quality, inclusive higher education to support positive outcomes for students with intellectual disability. Um, and we have seen three cohorts of model demonstration projects 
over the past uh, 11 years. Um, so since 2010, when this initiative was initially funded, um, this whole program has created 103 programs at 100 colleges and universities, serving almost 4,000 students in 31 states. So this is a massive initiative. It's um, oh, $11.8 million each year. It was less than that in the first cohort. I think um, our funding was much, much lower in the first five years. Um, but I would say probably since 2010, approximately 90 million federal dollars have been dedicated toward this initiative, maybe more. So this isn't, I mean, for, for, I feel like this is a really important initiative from the federal government. It has been always bipartisan in its support through different federal budgets. Um, so we, we, and we want it to stay that way. <laughs> we want everybody to think it's a good idea for people with intellectual disabilities to go to college and get jobs. I think we can all get behind that. Um, and um, we are thrilled to see how far it has come. These numbers don't include the latest cohort of TIPS -ids. Um, So here were the grantees in 2010 and 2015. You can see all those little um, dots. The, um, let me see if I can remember, the blue dots are for cohort one, the red dots were, or the blue dots were cohort one, red dots were, um, red stars were cohort two. You don't care when they got funded. These are all the places they got, that got money from the federal government to create ac access for people with intellectual disabilities. And these are the current grantees. So um, these, these competitions are really competitive. I think they had over 150 applications. Um, it's really hard to get tips of funding. The, the grants are for up to $500,000 a year for five years. So it's two and a half million dollars for each grantee. Some grantees are single source in that they are just developing or enhancing programs at a single program. Others are for consortia. So they might be developing three, five, six, ten. I think Georgia went for ten during their funding cycle. Um, so it's a real game changer to have this influx of intention and resource. Um, and if you want to know more about them, there's a section on our website that's called Tipsits. You can see all of the grantees and their abstracts. And they represent about a third of the higher ed programs in the United States. So TIPSID is not everybody. TIPSID is just somebody who applied for and received federal funding to do this. Um, two thirds of the programs that exist in the country have not received TIPSID funding. So what are the students doing when they go to a TIPSID? Well, all sorts of good stuff. They're enrolling in college courses, sometimes for credit, sometimes for honor the credit options have grown substantially over the past seven years. Um, they're participating in internships and work study. They get paid jobs on and off campus. Um, they're participating in campus life organizations and they're really learning how to live independently um, and to navigate both the campus and their community um, in ways that are sustainable post living at the college. So um, just to give you a snapshot of, of what the TIPSIDs did la last year, my, I'm sorry I'm not sharing um, data from the 2019-2020 cohort. Um, that report is in development. We're actually deep, deep, deep in those data and it's pretty messy right now. Um, we're hoping that that'll come out in the next few months. So I wanted to give you really clean data. So from the 2018-2019, year the two, 981 students were served in TIPSIDs at 57 colleges and universities. They attended over 6,700 college courses um, and 58% of those enrollments were in academically inclusive classes. So um, there is uh, many colleges still offer specialized courses, but they are moving toward providing an increase in inclusive courses. And that becomes really important when you want to have good employment outcomes, because I will share some data later that you'll go, oh, okay, specialized courses do not equal employment outcomes. So um, 
so just to give you a snapshot of sort of what it looks like in terms of employment, I really focused on employment data here. So there is more information about academic access if you want it. 53% um, of students had one paid position while enrolled. A paid position could be either a paid employment situation or a paid work-based learning experience or a paid internship. So we combine those, those um, types of paid employment and call them paid positions. Students held 774 paid positions and 36% of students with the paid position had more than one position. So the, the extent to which employment is emphasized in these programs is strong. It becomes increasingly stronger, I think, as the student matures through the program. Often employment in the first year might really be exploratory, looking at career exploration, job tryouts. Um, I think as people move through their program, they become a little more intentional and intensive in the, ex the employment experiences. Um, so here's, I love these data. These are some of my favorite data because it compares students with intellectual disability who are attending college and how many of them are, have jobs while they're in college with full-time undergraduate students who are employed. So this is what everybody, every other college student is doing. So if you look at the, um, the orange line, those are students in the TIPSID program. And you can see in cohort one, it kind of took them a while over the first few years to kind of get up and running, which is not unexpected. These were br a brand new initiative. Then you can see they were about the same. Well, then you look at cohort two, they started a heck of a lot higher than the previous cohort started. They started at 43% exactly at the same rate as students without, not without disability, without intellectual disability, without disabilities. And now you look at year four, 10% um, higher levels of employed while enrolled in college than students without disability. So, I'm just saying, it's don't tell me it's not possible. It's possible. These students can have jobs and go to college and take classes and succeed because these are the data. So after, you know, talking about this for 20 some odd years, it's really fun. As you can tell, I'm, I love these data. <laughs> um, paid employment at exit. Now we don't compare these with students without disability, because we know there's huge disparity between employment for people with and without disability writ large. But if you, these are compared with the adults served by IDD agencies, which is kind of the same population of students. These are students who are eligible to receive IDD services who had a paid job. And if you look at both cohorts, um, 18% of students served by IDD agencies have paid jobs, whereas 52% of these students who attended college <laughs> have a paid job. And I will, uh, I'm, I'm gonna make this note. During cohort one, I remember very strongly, there were students that had the TIPSID not de been developed, their only option out of high school was to go into sheltered workshops. That was their own, or to day habilitation. They, they, there was nothing in their region. The only outcome that their IEP team was looking at was either day habilitation or sheltered work. But then this tips had got funded and suddenly this same person was going to take college classes and do internships and get a job. So I'm just saying this is a really nice option to have on the table um, as, as we look at supporting transitioning youth to dream big. So what about long-term outcomes? What happens after? You know, you're just talking about in school, what happens after? Um, students who completed a TIPSIT program and had a paid job one year after exit, 63% um, were, were employed one year after, 73% were employed two years after, 75% were employed three years after. So the employment impact is sustained and sustainable. Um, I will say COVID kicked our butts this year though. The data from year five is, is going to look really different. And um, I'm frustrated because it was, it was on such a really strong trajectory, but you know, I think COVID mucked up a lot of things. So um, we will just move forward. 
So I did mention earlier, I was gonna tell you a little bit about predictors. Um, we've done a couple predictor studies of the TIPSID data. One positive predictor is the number of years attended. Do not take that to mean that longer is better. I think what that really represents is the first year students aren't employed. I think because people sometimes even wait to the second or third year to get students actual paid jobs. I am a big proponent of earlier is better, but I think these, this predictor finding relates specifically to um, how long it takes for people to start getting students real jobs. The negative predictor was the number of specialized courses. The higher the number of specialized courses, the less likely students were to be employed. So this helps you understand this, this, because so many students come from special education and because so many special education thought processes require specialization. Like what I, a question I've heard for 20 years is, what do these students need? What is a student with intellectual, what kind of classes should someone like that take? And I think um, whatever kind of class meets their interest and their needs and their goals, but it shouldn't be predicted by their disability label or God forbid their, their, um, their past history of needing support. So um, I, I, there's a slide I sometimes share of the types of courses people with ID should take and it's every course in the catalog, <laughs> it's every single one. So, um, what didn't predict paid employment? Here's another one that might be an aha moment. Unpaid career development experience were not found to be a significant predictor of students getting jobs. And I think this might be representative of sometimes programs have these experiences and certainly transition programs in high schools have them. Oh, you're gonna try this out. You're gonna try this out. You got six weeks at this location and six weeks in this, oh God help me slot. I want to get rid of the word slot. Um, unpaid career development, I think, has a purpose and a role. I think it should be intentional. I should. I think you need to know what you're looking to get out of it. And once you've learned that, move on. Because you're wasting that student's time and you're wasting the employer's time if they're not really learning something. Sometimes it's I just don't wanna be here. I thought I wanted to work with little kids and they're driving me nuts, get me out of here. I don't need six weeks to know that. <laughs> so I think one of the things this really caused us to do is to ask the TIPSIDs to really be intentional and thoughtful. What are students getting out of these unpaid career experiences? Um, and is it what you think they're getting or does it just sound employment-y and it gets, it checks that box. Um, so predictors of paid employment at exit, those cut across three different things. So one predictor of paid employment at exit was paid work prior to enrolling in the TIPSID. People who came in and had had employment prior to enrollment were more likely to be employed at exit. Um, I wish there were more of them. There were probably 45% of students who entered a TIPSID had never had paid job until they got in the TIPSID. So um, it just means we really need to be doing more for students to give them paid employment experience in high school. Um, paid work predicts paid work. Students who got a job while enrolled in the TIPSID were 15 times more likely to have a paid job at exit. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Some of those jobs were the same jobs, which is okay. <laughs> you know, many of us get a job in school and then we keep that job because it pays the bills and we continue on in school. I think for these students, that same dynamic is a positive. Um, and then the final predictor was the credential they earned. And if students earned a credential that was awarded by the IHE, which again means it is supported by the IHE, approved by the governance structure in the IHE, they um, almost doubled the odds of having a paid job. So what we don't want are fake little certificates that somebody you know prints on their inkjet printer that's a program certificate that isn't really representative of a higher education program or a higher education credential. And the credentialing issue is really critical. It's, it's a long conversation to have at the higher ed institution and it needs to be with partners. It can't just be 
Um, and I'm not saying a tips in creating credential is bad, as long as it was developed in partnership with the university and is supported by it, I think it's a real uh, positive, but it has implications for employment. So these are some of the options of the types of credentials offered in the TIPSIDs. Um, they could create a new credential that only their students could earn. They could create a new credential that all students could earn, or they could offer access to an existing credential that was already approved and awarded by the IHE. So all of these are options, they're all viable options. Um, but as you can see, we believe that any and all of these should be approved by the IHE for it to have the most impact because it's not just what the student walks out with. If they wanna to go to another higher ed institute, I don't know how many of you on the call finished learning after your first learning experience. But for me, I was in school for a while. I worked for a while and then I went back. People, when I went back, wanted to see what I had in my hand. <laughs> And was it legitimate and what did it represent and what courses did I take? So we should be arming these students for that trajectory of revisiting higher education as their interest or their career needs it. Um, so this is just a great story. We actually did a story about this young man um, who got a great job. He was at the Virginia Commonwealth University program um, quite a while ago. Um, there are lots of stories on Think College. Um, if you want to know more about our data, we do an annual report on the TIPSIDs every year. We have nine reports. I'm working on the 10th right now. They're all free and publicly available. Lots of stories, these publications, insight briefs, how to Think College, um, the We Can Think College. We have a plain language series, grab and go practices for ed coaches and people in the field doing transition. Um, all sorts of stuff. So we have materials for you. We also have innovation exchange pages, which we've been around for 10 years. We got lots of resources. It's confusing. It's overwhelming. It's too much. So we created these pages. If like, I just want to know your top four things, <laughs> go to the innovation exchange page. You'll have our top three resources, a video, a webinar, a couple print documents, but it'll, it gives you that nice, uh, surface level of just give me your best stuff. So that's a place to start. It's set up topically. We have affinity groups, sort of like your community of practice, very topically based. We have one on voc rehab. We just started one on employment. I'm not sure that's on this slide. Um, today I was on the research affinity group. There were 25 people from all over the country who are doing research in higher inclusive higher ed. Um, so feel free to join any and all of these. Um, and I mentioned earlier, we do have a help desk. If you send an email to me or any one of my team, it'll get forwarded to this help desk and we assign it to the person who is best um, suited to respond to your question. Mandy, that's why I ended up with your ticket because Kate's like, oh, Meg loves employment. Meg should do the employment one. I'm so glad that we ended up with you. <laughs> well, I am too. Um, so um, let me see, this is the one that I'm not sure is gonna work. Let me see, oh, no, no, this isn't that one. So these are just questions for you guys to consider as you move forward with your community of practice. How can you explore more inclusive higher education um, as a pathway to employment or expand your knowledge of college-based employment practices for youth with IDD? How can you build higher ed into future employment initiatives for youth with IDD? I think we talk about college and employment as two different things too often. They should be paired. They should be mixed. You don't have to choose one or the other. You should be able to switch back and forth if you're a person with IDD. Um, and I don't think that decision should be made at 14 or 16 or 18. I think that option should be on the table for a lifetime. I'm 53 years old. If I want to go back to school, I have that option. Everybody else should have that option too. Um, provide more targeted information when, you, when using work incentives in college for youth with IDD. So um, looking at how you can provide those work incentives and try to infuse them into a college program. Um, so this, I'm, I'm hoping this works well. This is just a little public service announcement that we created a few years ago, and we actually had it airing on Comcast stations for about a year for free through a partnership with Comcast. And it was fantastic because people would call me and be like, I was at a sports bar last night and I saw a pink college commercial. <laughs> but these are all available on our website for free too. So let's see if this works. 
When I was younger, I was never told to think about going to college. I was never really told to think big about much. But I still wanted to go to college. Like my sister. It took a lot of work. But I made it. And I'm a student at Bridgewater State University. At Mass Bay Community College. At UMass Boston. To make your dreams come true. And think college. For information about college for people with intellectual disabilities, visit thinkcollege.net. Yay, it worked. Um, okay, so here's our website and the help desk. I will say we have a Facebook um, page and we're on Twitter. We're pretty active, so follow us if you kind of want to stay in the loop. If you sign up for our mailing list, we send out a newsletter once a month with everything we know about what's happening in the country about inclusive higher ed. Um, and with that, I will <laughs> hit the pause button and see if you have any questions. That was great, Meg. Take a deep breath. That was fantastic. And I just want to I want to touch on something that she said. It was the first sentence of her presentation and it was very astute and she hit the nail on the head that we are we are focusing on, you know, this was a grant that was funded by the Developmental Disabilities Council. And so our main focus is the IDD population, but just like uh, Dr. Grego said, this is going to expand outcomes for all individuals with disabilities. The conversation that we have is not uh, it's not going to specifically be, we might be looking at the data and looking at the outcomes for individuals with IDD, uh, but the strategies and the best practices that we come up with, I think we'll be able to, uh, across the board, assist individuals with disabilities in general. And so it was very astute that that was the first thing that you picked up on. Uh, and thank you for, for touching on that. And I did drop in the chat, um, the Think College website, as well as a, uh, a fact sheet that I shared there if you want to save that PDF. And those affinity groups look fantastic. I'm going to join at least one of them. Oh, good. That's great. <laughs> um, and actually, you already have a, a question in chat from Melina, and it was, um, is there a specific process that programs have to go through to get a CTP designation? Yeah, Melina, there sure is. Um, so the approver of comprehensive transition programs is actually Office of Federal Student Aid, the Federal Office of Federal Student Aid. Um, so you have to complete a, an application that describes your course of study, describes your student um, academic progress policy, uh, just kind of proves that you're providing at a minimum 50% inclusive academic access for students. You have to meet the regulatory requirements to become a CTP approved program. Um, we at Think College, um, we don't have anything to do with program approval, but we do have a module step-by-step -step on how to create the process, how to, how to produce the application. We have sample applications for you to use. All the information in our approval, um, our, our process was approved by federal student aid. Like we ran it up the flagpole. We made sure they're like, yes, this is it. Um, so we've really held people's hands. I, my colleagues, Claire and Kate, have read multiple people applications just to help people and kind of make sure they avoid any mistakes. I will say the applicant is not the program. The applicant is the Office of Federal Student Aid. So if you're not talking to your Office of Federal Student Aid and you're thinking of doing this, you really need to begin those conversations. They are also the people who find out they get approved and if they don't know you, you're not going to know you're approved. <laughs> so really important. The other cool thing is that you can put in an application to be approved for a program that hasn't even started yet. And if you put in a, an application and it gets approved, you can retroactively, I think, up to one semester, provide access to student aid for students. So um, it's growing. Um, uh, we, we do get some data from federal student aid on the number of Pell Grant recipients. The, the last thing I didn't, since I, I took CTP out of here because I was trying to keep it short, which I also didn't do. Um, you can, students with intellectual disability who are at an eligible institution that's approved by CTP can apply for and receive three types of federal student aid. They can get Pell Grants, they can get supplemental educational opportunity grants, and they can get federal work study funds. They are not eligible for student loans, and they're not eligible for Parent PLUS loans. So just to keep in mind that it's a limited form of student aid, not all of federal student aid. 
I hope that answers your question, Melina. Yes, so you guys, thank you. You guys have done a lot of the legwork and uh, research, it sounds like, to support um, agencies like, like WVU's Country Roads Program that want to access. Uh, so thank you for I that. I hope so, yeah. They, I hope somebody from there joins our um, some of our affinity groups. Um, we also have a Facebook page for programs that we began during COVID because people were freaking out and it was really, really hard to provide academic access and employment supports to students who, when a campus was closed, <laughs> So we had help desk sections weekly with all the programs in the country or whoever wanted to come. And then we created a Facebook page only for program staff, not parents, not students, for staff to talk to staff about challenges and solutions. And they're super generous. They share resources. They're just great. That's um, great. So yeah, I will say this community, the inclusive higher ed community is, is everybody else's biggest fan. They are all, there's, there's not a competitive bone in their body. They just are really ready to help you share what worked with them. Um, yeah, it's a great network. Great. Any other specific questions for Meg? And I think that everyone, I mean, I know I'm gonna explore the website and look at those affinity groups. And it looked like there was a group for probably everyone uh, that's here with us today. Uh, but I want you to continue your time on this team. So <laughs> if you've got enough to spare. Right. Well, ours <laughs> only meet um, quarterly typically, and you don't have to go to every meeting. People show up as they're interested and yes. drop off. There is no like requirement or anything. It's like, hey, I'm actually pretty sure I'll pop in. That's great. That's nice. There's flexibility. And we did have a note from Glenda that she's used the site a few times. So that's nice to hear, uh, but didn't know about the groups. So there we go. And that's hopefully, you know, between resource sharing and networking and some of the other, you know, focused conversations we're going to have. That's really what it's all about. So I'm glad to hear that, Glenda. Thanks for sharing. All right, uh, so just a reminder in the chat, there's some resources from Think College. I think there's a lot that can be gleaned from the work that they're doing. And thank you so much, Dr. Griggle. That was a nice little sneak peek. I know you could probably give us a three hour presentation. So I appreciate the watered down version. And you know, we're behind schedule, but this is our first COP. So we're really gonna get, we're just gonna get a feel for the process today. And uh, you know, we've got about 30 minutes left. And that gives us enough time to do the next two parts of our, um, our presentation together, but just a little lighter version. So we're doing just great. So thank you so much, Meg. Very much appreciate you. Please stick around and be part of our groups if you have the time for it. And I'm also going to share, is it all right if I share the interview, Meg, from... Um, I, sure. I don't know which I don't know which one you're talking I don't know about. how many interviews you do, but this one was particularly... Um, exciting. I thought it was from 2018 and it was just kind of a background. Um, so I'll share that in the, the chat as well. And I know you can't um, copy and paste from the chat, which I find very frustrating, but you can open links and you can save them for later. So anytime I drop a link in there, I apologize for the non copy paste abilities, but save it for later, keep it in your tabs. And so I think that was a really great conversation to get us started. Um, you know, it's nice to see so many programs across the country that are inclusive uh, in higher education settings. And again, for you know individuals with uh, intellectual or developmental disabilities, or the whole the whole gamut. You know, what are the supports? What's the the big picture there? And so if we can look at some strategies for inclusivity, uh, that's really going to open up doors for for a lot of people, um, regardless of what your specific diagnosis might be. So uh, I want us to keep in mind the, the data and the ideas that Meg shared with us, and we're going to practice going into our groups. We're going to have a really short um, time with it, but we're going to get the feel for it, and we're going to know exactly what we're doing uh, when we come back for future meetings. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to break us into three rooms. One group is going to stay here in the main session with me. And one group is going to go um, with Jen and one group is going to go with Courtney. And I'm just randomly assigning these. Uh, one group is gonna focus more employer perspective. One group is gonna focus more on an employee perspective. And uh, one group is gonna focus on the perspective of community agencies. But you do not have to be part of that population to think about 
um, their perspective and some of the different concepts. So I'm creating rooms right now as I'm clicking and I'm trying to do them fairly evenly. And when I open these rooms, you should get an invitation um, to go to those. So, and I might have to move you around a little bit. Um, oh, I guess I should put Jen and Courtney in the right room. So that might be helpful. Okay, I'm gonna make the rooms and then I'll probably have to move people around a little bit. So breakout rooms. Did you say the three groups were again? Um, well, they're, they're gonna focus on three different perspectives, but you're not going to that group that represents you, but we're looking at employer, employee, and community agency just to get to think from their point of view. But you do not have to be part of that population to join that group. I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna try opening all the rooms. If you've been invited to a breakout room, go ahead and join it. And then I'll probably have to move a couple people around. All right, so we have a group left in here. It looks like people have stopped moving. Hopefully I saved some people for my room. That got a little dicey there. Break. I'm still here. Oh, Melina, yeah, you can stay. You can stay with us even though you're driving. And I know people have appointments. If you need to come and go in the series, uh, you do what you need to do. Let me go make sure. Um, I'm going to leave the room for just one moment and I'll be right back to see. I'm sorry, Glenda, what'd you say? Oh, I was just asking if this is going to be a consistent group thing like that. Uh, we will randomize the groups each month, but I'll have at least one person stay consistent and I'll be right back to tell you more about that. I think I, let me just make sure I got people in the rooms they need to be in and I'll be right back. Perspective group. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be asking for somebody to lead the group because that's not me. I'm just the moderator. So I want a team leader, a timekeeper. And they will record those. We'll have a timekeeper, so someone just to keep uh, ahead of things. And Mandy, I see that you joined us. I was just making sure I put you and Courtney in two separate rooms. We're a little unbalanced in our numbers, but I was struggling. So it looks like a great group. Nice to see you guys. All right, thank you. So we'll just need a timekeeper to kind of keep us uh, on track. Now, today will be a little bit different because I know that we were. Our I made it back to you guys. Okay, great. <laughs> So uh, we're going to work together today in our small group, and it's going, to be, um, it's going to be a shortened version, and just to get an idea of what we're going to do. And we are the group that is going to look at the perspective of the employer. So we're going to think about what our employers dealing with, what is the current state, are they partnering with colleges? So we're going to put our shoe, put ourselves in the shoes of an employer. And what I would like to ask is if anyone in this group. Um, and it would be if you if you think you're going to make it to most of the series, uh, we'll have three positions that change each month. But I'm looking for a team captain for the employer group because I will be here each month. Um, well, God willing. Um, and, and so I'm looking for someone in the group that would be willing to say, I'm probably going to make it to most of the meetings. I want to be part of this team. And so I'll be your kind of co-moderator in the employer group. So do I have anyone that's just like totally enthusiastic and wants to agree to do that? All right, I'll ask again at the end. And we'll see if anyone's changed their mind. It is not in a high-pressure situation. Who said that? Glenda. Glenda, thank you, the Glenda. The talkative one. <laughs> All right. Well, you should be a team captain. That makes sense. So every month, Glenda will be in the employer room with me. And you all may be randomized to other rooms to just join those other discussions. So um, I also am looking for each month we will identify... We're not gonna have a lot of time to do it this month, but just so you know what we're gonna jump in and do next month. Uh, so I've got the team captain, I'm the moderator, and then I need a reporter, a recorder, and a timekeeper. I'm gonna be the timekeeper today because we are on crunch time. Normally what that would look like is, okay, we have 24 minutes, we have questions, 
I'm going to watch the clock. And when four minutes go by, I'm going to tell the group we need to move to the next question. Not a lot of pressure there. I'm going to do it today because we've got like, I don't know, a minute for each question. Um, the reporter is going to share for three to five minutes when we go back into the main session. Today, it'll be maybe two minutes we share. Um, and you're going to share a highlight from what we do in the group. And probably the recorder has the trickiest job. And it is, I'm going to drop a file in the chat. And everybody's welcome to um, download it. But these are the sh summary sheets. And I just need to find it. Summary report. Oh, no, that's agency. We need employer. Um, we're going to take notes and report back to the So let me see if I can share this. We're working out all the technical difficulties here today. Employer. And so can I get someone that's willing to take, oh, I'm sorry. Can I get someone that's willing to take notes today typing that is not Glenda because she's already got an assignment. Someone to take notes. A community of practice means we need to depend on our community to do the work. Mm. No, I'll do it today, mm. but I'm not gonna do it next month. Mm. All right, mm. so I'm gonna share my screen and I'll show you what it is and then you'll know that it's not scary. Mm. I know Jen and Courtney aren't doing it. I know they made someone do it, but I'm not real tough. <laughs> I'm not super tough. So I'm going to open it up. And then next month, you guys are going to be like, oh, this is so easy. I'll totally agree to do it. Share screen, employer perspective. Okay. So we will fill this in completely next month. And this is what we're looking at. So we've got about 12 minutes until we need to go back to the main room. So we know who our guest speaker was. We know what we're talking about. Uh, we have identified Glenda. Thank you very much. And I'll do all the work this time, guys, just this time. So a few questions, and I wanna start with uh, question number six, because question number six is always gonna have to do with the presentation that we just watched listen to. And so briefly describe the main focus of the presentation, the guest speaker that we heard from, and something we can take away from it to adapt to West Virginia. So real quick, we're, we're just lightning responses today. We'll have more time next month. But what are we going to take away from what Meg shared with us um, that's going to be valuable to us in West Virginia in serving individuals with IDP or other disabilities? Knowing how to start the process to get into the information that she was saying earlier. I forget what so, it was called. So just even having the programs available in West Virginia. Yeah. Yeah, and we have country roads. We're starting at WVU, uh, but it's in the real beginning stages and we're not linked up with uh, a lot of these funding sources and partners uh, that Meg mentioned. So yeah, establishing these programs um, and as for establishing programs in West Virginia for higher education. Very good. Um, and knowing what department that you need to have actually file the application versus you. Who, what, when, where, why. So, yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Um, very good. Thank you. I also thought it was helpful that, you know, I knew of Think College and some of their resources, but I didn't know of all of them. Um, so I'll definitely be looking at it myself and then also sharing with families, especially like the the funding and, and things like that. So information, referral resources that we can turn around and distribute. And just like we heard, oh, we've, we've seen the website but didn't know about the affinity group. So just a, an expanse of, of, of knowledge and resources. Good, and that's for staff and for families. Great, thank you, Melina. Okay, so again, lightning fast. So I just wanted to make sure we could respond to that when we get back to the main group. Um, so let's see what we think here. Do you think that colleges and employers across West Virginia are partnering well to identify and place qualified job applicants? And we kind of answered that anonymously um, in our pre-survey. So 
what do you guys know? Do you do you think, do you hear that colleges, whether you've worked in higher education or with a, um, an employer, um, do you find that those conversations are happening between employers and colleges? The only one I'm aware of in my area would be Bridge Valley and the Toyota manufacturing. Yes, Toyota's fantastic. Oh my gosh, they do some really neat stuff. And Bridge Valley, they've actually, they're, they're really active with the workforce regional boards. Um, so yeah, Bridge Valley is real. And, and that's great that we can mention some specifics too. Fantastic. Um, I think uh, Mandy, that, I think that, uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I think that uh, WVU and, and schools like Fairmont State are pretty good. Good. That's good specific feedback, guys. Thank you, Jeff. Melina, were you going to add something? I was going to say that I think that a lot of employers will work with colleges for job fairs and things like that, but I don't know how much they work with students with disabilities coming out of college. Okay. That's a good point. So they're doing it, but how can we be more inclusive? Very good. Anyone else? I know, I know when Ruby does a job fair, they, they work with, I work with Pace Enterprises in mm -hmm. um, Morgantown and Fairmont. And they are excited to see us when we come to the job fairs. And that blew awesome. me away the first time that that happened. And Fairmont State and Pierpont, both their disability department really tries. So I always spell yeah, Pierpont Fairmont wrong State the first time. Accommodating, Mandy. They, they, they go out of their way to try to accommodate us. When we come in. That's great to hear. Have they hired some of your, your clients that you've taken to the job fair? We know if they've actually hired. Have we had placements as a result? I have it. Uh, are you talking to me? Uh, yeah, sure. I, anyone that can respond. Yeah, yeah. So if DRS, if, if DRS is is having a conversation and they're being welcomed at job fairs, are you seeing the placements come out from from those conversations? I've seen a few, not a whole lot, okay. but I've seen okay. a few. Hey, we'll take that. That's that's something that's better than nothing. All right, I'm going to go and we're not going to get all of our questions, of course, and we did just we just answered some specifics here. So I'm going to skip number two. So we did identify some universities and colleges that we know are making strides. Um, and so what policies, programs and resources out there? What do we know of that's out there to support employers? So we were saying that community agencies are welcomed to the conversation. Um, what conversations are you having with employers? You're saying, I can provide a job coach. Um, are you offering resources about um, incentive programs? Does anyone have any input on this? Well, I, I offer incentives. I let them know about how to get accommodations and um, job coaches, like you said, that it, how it works. I break things down for the employers when I talk to them. I Good. go over any questions they have and I make it so they understand the benefits to them. And I promote the fact that more people with intellectual disabilities or disabilities are happy to get to have a job. And a lot of times they work harder than anybody else because they're just so excited that someone will actually look at them like a human being. And I think you'll see that um, portrayed in some of the data, some of our uh, other guest speakers um, coming on retention and longevity and, and you know, it just employee satisfaction. Um, so yeah, that's great that you mentioned that. Thank you. Um, anyone think of any programs that are gone, that they miss, things that worked, but maybe the funding dried up? I know I miss the disability program navigators at Workforce West Virginia. Um, I found that they uh, were a fantastic resource and they weren't around for long enough. Uh, I don't know if anybody remembers disability program navigators. They were housed in the one stops um, and they were CED staff. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Stick around for too long. And then there was Tracy, maybe you know, it was, uh, um, it was the financial aid group and I've forgotten what they're called, but it was like the conglomerate that brought together all the different financial aid pieces and helped with the FAFSA and they were around for a couple of years. I can't think off the top of my head. I used to include them in all of my grant writing, even though they didn't exist anymore because I still had all the resources on my shelf and it's been so many years now, but there was, there was kind of like a, um, 
they had received funding to put all the information together on financial aid. And like they had a bus that went around um, and oh. you could come on the bus and use the computers. Um, it was it was really hip. It was trending. And then of course the funding dried up for it, but it was, it was kind of just like a, um, a clearing house of the financial aid that's available in West Virginia. So I'll, I'll just type that. Anything else that you know of that's gone that you wish was still around? Well, that's good. Or maybe that's bad, I don't know. And finally, um, do you think employers are offering tuition credits, reimbursements, or stipends at a rate that's encouraging individuals to advance? So that would be someone who's already employed and they're encouraging their employees to continue their education and they're offering stipends, credits, support, whatever it looks like. Um, WVU Medicine's good with that, Mandy. Okay, good. So that's real specific. So we know it's at least happening a little bit. So, uh, promotion within, or are they going out and hiring people with higher education degrees and, you know, just kind of going right over the staff that they've already trained that would potentially include individuals with disabilities. So we're looking for opportunities for advancement in that education and those lifelong learners um, that we talk about so often. So we know I think it really depends on bit. the area. WVU Medicine is a perfect example. I think you find that a lot in healthcare, um, promotion from within, moving up, you know what I mean, from within, training from within. I think when you get into certain other industries, it's, it's not as prevalent. I think um, that's fair to say. Mm. Yeah, so I, 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 think it, I think it honestly depends on industry. Thank you for that perspective. Yeah, and I think that's, yeah, uh, and that's gonna be across regions and across industries. Absolutely. All right, so that was lightning version, uh, but next month I'm gonna assign these to other people because we're gonna have more time to get into it. And Glenda, I've got you on board for next month, but not super scary, right? Mm. No. I'll report back if y'all want. I mean, we're going to be, this is the quickest report we're going to have of this <laughs> uh, until November. So I can report and then I'll just model good behavior and then you guys can do it uh, next, uh, next month. So I'm going to stop share and keep my notes up and I'm going to close the rooms. I think, okay, they get one minute to come back well, maybe <laughs> on their own. I want to make sure I get you guys out of here by five, even if we have to cut our conversation short, because I want you to know that I respect your time because I want you to come back. So we'll report first, and then we'll just ask everybody um, to report on two items. And what we're going to do in the background, Courtney, Jen, and myself, is we're going to compile all of this information into our summary reports. So it's not terrible that we don't get to cover it all, uh, because this will all be distributed to people that participate in the communities of practice. That's so the whole... PowerPoint's also going to be... Uh, well, yeah, I know that um, Meg said that she provided hers, and I can distribute that to the registration list. And so I think that'll really depend on guest speakers. Uh, but I think for the majority people will want to share uh, want us to be able to share that and the meetings will also be recorded um as you know i found my record button before we started talking and so you can share this with other individuals that might be uh, maybe want to join us but didn't want to miss the first conversation that sort of thing because we are going to have to grow this group and i'm going to ask you all to help me do that Okay, I think we're about all back. And if we ever lose people when we close rooms, please just come back in. I don't know. I don't know what that's a function of, but I always find we lose a couple people. So we got Courtney, you guys are back. Oh, we don't have Jen yet. We're oh. back. Oh, where are you? I'm here somewhere. <laughs> oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> so guys, that was a lightning speed round, but that's what we're going to do. And typically we would have about 20 or 25 more minutes to respond back to the group. And so the way our group did it is we did question number six first, because I really wanted to grab what we were thinking about everything that Meg talked to us about. I really wanted to grab what our main theme of the conversation was. Um, so I made sure that we did that one, and then we spent about one minute on um, each of the other questions. And you guys probably did it a little differently in your rooms, and um, you know we'll have more time to expand on that next month. So I'm going to give you guys a, a one minute. So Jen and Courtney, do you guys have a, a reporter identified? Okay. I just so we're 
go ahead. Uh, well, normally we'll have about five minutes to report back to the group. And I had trouble assigning roles. So I did them all except for Glenda's my team captain. Uh, and I'm, I'm just modeling what it looks like for next month. So I'm just going to tell you guys in one minute or less what we talked about. And then I'm going to ask Courtney and Jen's groups to do the same. Um, so we talked about from an employer perspective, we talked about whether or not employers and colleges are partnering well to place um, job applicants coming out of college programs. And we think that's happening a good bit. We specified that Bridge Valley, WVU, Fairmont State, Pierpont, um, and Toyota partners with Bridge Valley. And those were some real strong um, responses that we had that that's, that's happening. And community agencies report that they're uh, often invited to talk and be part of that conversation. And they're welcome. Uh, we talked about employer incentives for um, supporting those going to work coming out of college programs being assistance with accommodation supports like job coaching um, ongoing ongoing support like that and employers are welcome in most cases they're, they're welcoming to that and they want the support we talked about um, college uh, programs that existed in the past that weren't around anymore and we couldn't really come up with a whole lot um, i mentioned the disability program navigators that used to be um, stationed in the one stops. I thought they were really helpful and I was sad when they went away. And there used to be a group, I couldn't think of what the name was, but it was a clearinghouse for financial aid resources. And it was everything FAFSA, grant scholarship related for West Virginia. And they were funded for a couple of years and then uh, that went away, but I missed that. Mm -hmm. And we talked about tuition credits and reimbursements and incentives for employers to advance within. And we identified that we know WVU Medicine, we feel does this well. And then we talked about the fact that it usually depends on the local area and the industry as to whether they're helping people advance within or if they're maybe bringing in um, new candidates with that higher degree or whatever the situation is. And we encapsulated our presentation as um, the, the main focus of the presentation was starting processes for establishing programs for higher education, specifically for individuals with IDD, and the kind of who, what, when, and where of how we can access those programs, bring them to West Virginia, and then um, enroll in them. Okay. Uh, Jen's group was the agency perspective. Mm -hmm. And give us a one minute. To, all I have before we leave is a quick poll, and then we'll get out of here. Okay, since I've got everything written down, I'll go ahead and go for our group. Um, just to talk a little bit about what we took away from um, Dr. Gurgel's presentation and how we can adapt those things to West Virginia. Um, we liked the statement about unpaid work experiences and not putting a block on, not pushing people to complete an unpaid work experience if they have gotten everything that they need out of it. Um, we definitely want to see uh, Country Roads or another program from West Virginia in the box for West Virginia. Um, we talked about some resources that existed that were particularly beneficial beneficial that maybe now don't exist anymore um, is DRS ability to pay for services. Um, also DRS's ability to purchase transportation and the um, lack of the ability to teach students with disabilities how to drive um, mm -hmm. with the with that um, that program going away at Institute. But um, also some programs that might be missing is reaching transition age youth and juvenile justice systems um, and youth that are couch surfers. So those that aren't necessarily homeless but aren't in foster care, how do we um, reach them? Um, some of the things that we found that um, some well-known supports are um, West Virginia Division of Rehabilitation Services being the main source of assistance for transitioning to higher education and high schools um, having relationships with college disability services programs. Um, and then finally, what can we, what do we have to, that foster positive relationships? We have paid internships, um, trial work experiences up in the um, Wood County area. They have relationships with employers. Um, that such as DuPont and Mr. B's that gets um, employees get experience and employers get to see that the employees can do the job. Um, employer relations um, with WVU Parkersburg. Um, what do employers need when students who are in classes to learn specific skills? Um, so 
just knowing um, how to have those relationships and some of them that are already in place and to foster more of those throughout the states. Ooh, all right, take a breath. Courtney, your group, uh, wanna do a nutshell? Yeah, I'll go ahead and do it because we kind of had, I, I kind of assigned someone the reporter and I feel bad about that. So I'll to be the reporter. <laughs> So we weren't able to get through all the questions, but I picked up on several themes that we noted throughout it. And one big theme is that there are a lot of supports that individuals with IDD are provided in primary education. So, and then once they get into, like once they graduate, then um, all of those supports kind of go away in terms of the academic supports. So the um, adaptability of things and all of that. So I think that's a fear that a lot of um, individuals have with going into higher education is because those supports, uh, while there are supports there, they may not know well enough about them or be connected well enough with them, but also uh, they kind of go, a lot of them go away. So that's kind of an issue that they see with that. Um, another thing is, is that there's some perceptions, I think, or at least we thought, because we were coming from a different perspective, but that employees or employers may not always want to hire individuals with disabilities because they may need to take extra steps for it. So I think that's something that is definitely a huge barrier. So those were some of the two big themes that we discussed within ours. That's awesome, Courtney. Thanks for the synopsis. And I think our conversations here are gonna help identify those strategies for, well, maybe it's not that much extra work. Maybe we've just you know, assumed that, or maybe we had one bad experience, someone placed someone and never called us again. And you know they've they've remembered that, and so they're hesitant to uh, participate. And that's that's a perfect segue to end the meeting. That um, we're going to look to expand our employer participation. Um, we got great, and I want to mention you know community agencies. We're all employers. We're all employing people, so we all count as employers. And I want to make sure that that's not um, lost on us. But what we want to expand on is the number of industries that are willing to come to this table and talk with us. Um, you know, whether it's kids coming out of school or you know, older individuals that have been home on the couch, like we said, for a while, uh, we need to look at what we're missing and what we can bring to that table. So I'm going to bring up one last poll, and I want you guys to think about who you know. It could be your neighbor. It could be your cousin. It could be your mom. What industry do they represent? Someone that you think might come and be a part of this conversation. Um, and just to get an idea of who we might know out there, like just today, I invited um, Stonewall Jackson Resort, you know, to see if they might uh, could send someone to talk with us. Um, so who do you know, it, whether it's a business or a personal contact that might be interested in talking about how we increase employment for individuals with disabilities, specifically IDD or all of the above, uh, whether they're going to college, vocational trades or straight to work who will come talk to us. So I'll leave it up for 15 more seconds. I got some good answers already. Just to be an idea of who do we know in those industries out there? Because um, when young people ask us, you know, what do you know about this job? Who can we go to to find out more? In five seconds, okay, I'll end the poll and I'll show you. So this is who we think we know. We think we might be able to bring someone from administration and support, someone from government, manufacturing uh, from any of the STEM related fields and transportation. So uh, I would ask you all, uh, I'm going to send by email um, the next registration and it includes the rest of the communities of practice. And, and so uh, I'd like to see if we can double our group and expand the industries that we have represented. Again, we'll have more discussion, more time to talk about our responses uh, in future months, but I think you guys got a feel for what we're doing. And we're going to try to stick to our structure um, since I don't have so much to do in the future. Any questions, comments, concerns? Hopefully you have a better idea of the purpose of our series. And I hope to have you back. And Glenda, yes, we would want college aids kids with learning disabilities. We want clients, job seekers, workers, agencies. We want everyone who's interested in talking about increasing employment for the special population. Um, and thank you, Lynn, for making those additional um, invitations. All you can do is invite people. You know, if you invite 12 people and maybe one person shows up, I'm going to thank you for that. And they're going to contribute and add to the value that we're having uh, here in our conversations. So don't hesitate. And I told a lot of people that couldn't make it this month, come and join us next month, watch our video, see what we're doing, um, and come to the table next month. So if you, you know, if you know you're going to be out one or two times, don't hesitate. Don't 
not join because of that, because we want you at the table. Okay, so again, I'm sorry I went a little over. I appreciate you all very much. It's so nice to see your faces and I hope you had fun in the small discussions. I think those will be really uh, valuable for us over the months. All right, I'm gonna call it. We'll see you all next month. Look for an email from me with the next registration. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.